Welcome back to Small Business Big Lessons, a Buffer original series. My name is Ash Reed, Head of Content at Buffer, and throughout this series, we're going on a journey to understand how great work happens. We're telling stories of unique businesses and meeting the incredible people behind them, examining how they're doing things differently and what we can learn from their journeys. In today's episode, we'll be focused on what it looks like to stay true to your why and the amazing things that come from that decision for your business and for yourself. Finding your why and building a business based on that is something we hear a lot about in the business world. But how does that actually work in reality? Let's find out. I'm Stephen Tracy. I'm one of the co-owners of Keep Candles. After starting his career in London, Stephen moved to New York City in 2010 to work for a big tech company. It was an exciting life move, a huge change. But after a few years, he realized that something big was missing. So I worked for five years for Google, but I personally was finding myself waking up and not feeling a spark of joy in life. And so I was paying attention to that and it began raising the question of what should I be doing differently in my life? At that same time, Stephen's friend and colleague, Harry, was mirroring those feelings. We would both just found ourselves at this point of feeling unhappiness in our lives. And we would meet for coffees and talk about what we were thinking of doing next. And one day candles came up as a topic of conversation. It was both a surprise to find that we both loved candles so much, but it led us into a really beautiful conversation about how we enjoyed spending our time outside of work, about what it meant to be present, you know, and actually with people or even just present with yourself. And that immediately, you know, there's so many candle related aphorisms. So that lit a, that little match for us, you know, it was the spark <laughs> that led to, to learning more about candles. And, and suddenly fast forward a few months, we had begun putting down some plans on paper for, for starting a candle company. So the first thing we decided to do was to quit our jobs and figure it out from there, <laughs> which I'm, in hindsight, I'm not, not sure I'd 100% recommend that as the path for, for everyone. But we quit not having made a candle before, but decided to dive in sort of with, with both feet first and began figuring things out from there. For Stephen and Harry, building a business wasn't just about making money. They wanted to stand for something more. There was always clarity that we were not just making candles, that the candles represented something deeper and we wanted to use them as something that would allow for broader topics of conversation. And so that real deeper question of why were we doing this? What was this really about? Um, this wasn't about just trying to make as many candles as possible or sell as many candles. This was really about putting values, putting care and putting purpose behind a product. That was there from the beginning, but maybe not um, clarity at the level that I feel we've learned over the ensuing years. With this focus, they got to work, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. After three months, they still didn't have a product and finances were getting tight. We had spent a lot more money than we anticipated and had already done some pretty drastic things like cashing out our retirement savings. That was the first point at which I think financial pressure became, you know, a motivating force beyond any other. So we ended up within about four weeks putting together a Kickstarter to bring in some of the extra money we would need to actually make this first round of candles that we hadn't yet actually made. So that definitely was a deviation from, you know, maybe some of that purer sense of purpose that we were feeling going in. This financial pressure led to the duo making decisions that were based purely on money instead of the vision for the business they were looking to create. One focused on being present, connecting with one another and restoring our balance with nature. So pop-ups, yes. We got an email from a company who said, do you want to come and sell some candles at lunchtime to, to our employees? Yes. You know, we wouldn't have ever done these things before, but we would say yes to them because there was a path to selling some candles, making some sales and potentially getting some new customers. Now I realize that's not strategy, like that's not really how to run a business. We took on things that became sort of major new elements of what we were doing, um, but we only realized after sort of getting into them that it wasn't really part of what we had imagined ourselves doing, at least not 
at that point in in the company's life. So we had joined a store or a sort of grouping of young companies and young brands and makers and designers in a space called Canal Street Market. Really cool space on Canal Street in downtown Manhattan. Um, like I would feel cool just being there. So there was there were some things that kind of aesthetically attracted us to be part of it. But the thing we hadn't thought about that it was seven day a week retail. Roughly, I think it was like 10 a.m. till 7 p.m., 364 days a year. And we signed on to like a 12 month lease with no plan of how we were going to train retail people, of how we were going to hire retail people. We had got ourselves into a situation where we were now not spending our time doing the things we wanted to be doing, but it felt that we were trapped in a way that we were now having to show up and work a retail shift. And after a while, saying yes to everything began to take its toll on Stephen and Harry. I'll be really honest. Um, I think we began to feel that we were, number one, exhausted was probably the first feeling. I think not to one another, but probably in private to, to other people. We were beginning to worry about were we building a real business? Was there, you know, what, what even was Keep Becoming? And that sense of sort of a lack of enjoyment. And I think for me personally, I definitely had moments where I, I felt that, okay, you know, this hasn't worked out. What we're building, this is not how I imagined it would be. This isn't the thing I was passionate about. So clearly this has been a failure. You know, this has not worked out. So a sense that we were maybe reaching some sort of fairly quick end to this candle making experiment. So it was a pretty sad and like lonely place, I think, as well. Like loneliness is, I think, something a lot of entrepreneurs talk about. Because how can you relate all these things? You know, your personal dream having now potentially gone up in smoke. How do you really relate that to someone else who hasn't been on that journey with you? We eventually acknowledged that we were not in a happy place individually or as a business and that something needed to change. Um, And there was enough hope and optimism left in both of us to realize that there was a way out of this. We had spoken with a friend who had recently gone through a similar sort of crisis of confidence in the business they were building and had ended up working with a business coach and actually is ended up being the business coach we we ended up working with but oh, i have to be careful because i'm just such a big fan of holly so i'll go on and on about her my name's holly howard and i'm the business consultant that steve from keep came to see when he and harry were in a place of contemplating what growth meant to them and i run a small business consultancy called ask holly how here in brooklyn new york holly has a wide ranging background all the way from the performing arts to medical research But there was one particular experience she had that inspired her to start helping small businesses get off the ground and grow. When I was about 28 years old, I had an existential crisis and I ended up as a waitress um, waiting tables. And it was there at a restaurant that I learned a lot about small business and really the difference between having a passion for the small business and what it actually takes to operate the small business and grow it. And that's where I really learned how to teach myself about business and culture and systems and planning. So interestingly, one of the first questions Holly asked us was to just write down where we hoped our lives would be in five years time. So not where we hoped the business would be, but actually to start with the personal and to ask ourselves, what what did we want our lives to be like in five years time? It was a high just to be asked that question um, because it was not the type of question we would find ourselves as business partners asking one another. After spending so much time in the headspace of frantically trying to grow their business, it felt strange to Stephen and Harry to think so far into the future. They'd been so reactive in terms of their planning that taking a proactive approach began to feel intimidating. How much time does that take to answer? Um, it could it could take weeks or months of like genuine introspection about <laughs> where you know who you are and speaking with your life partners if you have one and speaking with your family. The low is more just in realizing, wow, this is a huge thing we're taking on. And then having to remind ourselves that that this was the right way to be prioritizing our time. And that if other things fell to the side and we didn't get to certain business priorities, that this was the business priority. Holly's approach to business consulting is unique in that she really believes in unifying the personal and the professional. 
To Holly, those two aspects of life are impossible to separate. And by exploring the personal goals and dreams of the business owners she works with, Holly guides them into realizing a unified vision for their business, but also for their lives. I start with the personal background because I feel like there's no separation between who you are as a person and what you're building within your business. I think in decades past, there has been this kind of idea of separation of self in some ways, or this idea that we look out into the market to decide, you know, what the need is and what we're going to create to fill that need. But the reality is so much of what we're creating isn't necessarily quote unquote needed as we think about what traditional needs might be, right? So nobody wakes up in the morning and says, as keep sells, like, oh, what I really need is a candle subscription service. Like that's going to solve my problem. So when we think about creating these businesses, it's really about our personal motivations and the creativity that comes from within us. And oftentimes to tap into that original creativity, we have to go really far back to a time when you know we were more in touch with that or more understanding about where those motivations came from and what we were trying to express in the world. Because I think as we grow into our adulthood, more of our personality persona gets built on top of what our true intentions are. I don't think at the time I really understood like what was going on in Holly's mind <laughs> in terms of asking these questions, but I knew it felt good to talk about where I wanted my life to be in five years time and to, to be honest about that and, you know, to acknowledge that it wasn't just all about working on the business 24 seven, that we have other aspects of our lives we want to nurture and, and spend time doing as well. The connecting of the dots sort of happened over time as we began using some of these clearer answers that we had to begin coming back to some other questions. And it was interesting to see how with clarity of some of these bigger answers, it became easier to understand where maybe conflict had been happening before, where maybe lack of certainty had been happening before, and to now answer those things with so much more, so much more certainty or so much more clarity, just having taken the time to step back. By reflecting on where you've come from, you can get a better idea of where you want to go. This technique for looking ahead is called visioning, and it's a key part of Holly's process. She speaks with passion about the importance of imagination and getting a real feel for what it is you want to build for yourself and for the world around you. So visioning is really the creative act of like stepping back from the market, from the economy, and asking yourself, like, what is it that I'm trying to build into the world? When this thing is fully realized, what does it look like? How does it feel? What impact does it have in the world? After these visioning sessions and sketching out their future, Stephen and Harry began questioning what their business actually needed to look like. We realized we needed to get clear on some of the aspects that sort of guide so much of what we do and like how we make decisions and how we would get better at not just saying yes to everything, but maybe more judiciously saying yes to the things that actually made sense for us to do. We managed to carve out what felt like very precious time to just spend time together, me and my business partner, talking about what is our purpose. Some of these things, you know, if you've read business books, purpose, mission, values, things that become buzzwords and maybe you've thought about them, but you haven't really ever done the work of making sure that there's total agreement on them, making sure that you've really, really thought and sort of lived with your answers to them. So we began doing that. Um, and I remember we began writing things down on paper and trying to hone in on these words. But I also remember feeling at times that we didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> it was like we were, we were trying to put this like theory into practice, but we had no experience of what it should look like when it's right and how to know that we'd sort of reached the point of it being done. As a small business owner, it's easy to fall into the trap of looking outwardly at other entrepreneurs for answers to some of the central questions you might have about your business. Questions like, who are we? What's the point of our product or service? How should we use our voice? How should we grow? And how big should we be aiming? Holly believes these answers must come from you as an individual and not the market. I think the number one factor that keeps people feeling frustrated in their business is how consumed we are by looking at what everybody else is doing within their business. I think that's the number one thing that blocks people because we now we're so 
bombarded with media, right? And we're consuming so much content and we're constantly evaluating ourselves against what we think is working for other people or what we think the lives are that other entrepreneurs are building or what we think the companies look like. So there's all this evaluation that happens when really we don't know the full story of anything that we see. No matter how many stories are written about whatever it is that we're seeing. So I always tell people it's so important to just like stay focused on your own vision. And this was very true for Keep. Despite a deep desire to build a business in their own way, Stephen and Harry were thinking about the well-worn business playbooks and approaches to growth. Like I said, when we first started, they were contemplating the model of venture capital and paid ads and the really traditional direct-to-consumer route <laughs> without a passion. It wasn't something that they wanted to do, but they didn't understand that maybe there was a different way to do it, or they had an opening that there was possibly a different way. And it's not uncommon for founders to feel a little lost in the early years of their business. In fact, Holly believes it's important for founders to allow themselves a few missteps along the way because these lead to opportunities for founders to truly understand why their business exists. I think in losing yourself before you find your why, to me goes back to this idea of the hero's journey. I don't know if you're familiar with the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell and you know the myth. I think you have to go through that darkness. You know, I think that's actually what makes people interesting if you have that journey, which is also where the idea of branding really drives me crazy because it feels like it never allows for this idea of change and that businesses, just like humans, are multifaceted. And, and I think that if we're not going through that journey of misunderstanding ourselves, it's very hard to know ourselves. And it's very hard to be compassionate or empathetic to others if you haven't gone through that journey yourself. Once Stephen and Harry reflected on their why, why they were building this business in the first place, they were able to change the way they approach decision-making at Keep. The biggest thing is I think we've got really quite good at making decisions because they make sense to us and not feeling we have to run them through the justification of you know, what the market is doing, but actually saying what feels right to us you know, as visionary leaders of a company, even if the company's only three people, you're still a leader and you're still creating the vision. What do we think is the right thing to do here? And then staying true to that. So keeping all of our decisions truly in line with our vision and truly in line with our values, which we now have very clearly documented. We do that all the time now. So when we're planning for next year or, or for the long term, we make sure there isn't any things in there or any dissonance that still exists in our plan is being worked out of our business towards a truly like integrated sense of the company being the one that we wish to build. This newfound belief that they could build a company in their own way led to some big realizations and decisions. Stephen is from the Channel Island of Guernsey, but had moved to New York to work for Google and was now realizing he wanted to be spending more time by the sea. Harry grew up in France and Italy, amongst other places, but was born in New York and felt an affinity for the Hudson Valley, an area two hours north of New York City. So these are pretty like big differences. You know, I want to be by the sea. <laughs> I might want to be back in Europe. He wants to be up in the woods a few hours north of New York. But ultimately, the business, we're the owners of it. And also, it's I think the thing I learned in, in the process is that it's very important that the plan for the business takes into account the humans, like the personal side of things too. Because otherwise, of course, the dissonance is going to be there. If the business is taking you to places you don't want to spend your time, part of a lot of people's dream to be an entrepreneur is to have personal freedom. So why would you then want to end up feeling like you're in a place or spending your time doing things you never wish to do or, or in a place you never wish to be? Beforehand, we'd talked about the long-term location of Keep, but we'd always kind of shirked it because I think we could feel that there was this tension between different personal dreams and hopes. And it felt like maybe in 10 years time, maybe in 20 years time when we're like a massive company, we'll think about moving it out of the city. But with these personal stories coming quite clearly down on paper that in the next five years, we did hope to begin at least a journey towards these new locations that were quite different. We, we ended up getting clear quite quickly that this move was going to have to happen soon if it was going to be practical and not become you know, something that grew ever more challenging. 
With a lease expiring within 12 months and new leases asking for three to five years of renewal, Stephen and Harry realized they needed to move their company within a year to keep up with their five-year vision. And there's just no way that we ever would have got to that answer if we'd started from you know, today, what should we be doing in 11 months? We never would have decided to move the company. <laughs> but the other fun thing to see was that once we knew that that's what we needed to do, but that it was sort of in service to these dreams that we had, it was really exciting. That move, which obviously took a lot of planning, it just felt like a beautiful step towards these bigger pictures that we've drawn for ourselves. Um, so the energy that that we had maybe begun to feel was becoming compressed and you know dark as some of the words I used before just began to feel that really like refreshing lightness and joy again. Since moving to the Hudson Valley Stephen and Harry are able to be present in the ways they craved at the beginning of their business journey. They can spend more time in nature and have even started to grow some of their own candle ingredients. I wanted to ask Stephen about some of the key lessons he'd learned through the process of rediscovering the why behind his business. I think I was kind of expecting some snappy business tips, but his response was much more personal and speaks to what happens when you unify your philosophy on life with your true intentions for your business. No, the reason I want to think about that for a moment is because I think personally for me, that goes really, it goes really deep. That question takes me to some of the deepest like lessons I've learned about life from my own journey so far. Because I do think, um, you know, business growth is personal growth. You can't separate as an entrepreneur, as an owner of a company, the lessons you have to learn from the lessons the business has to learn. They're very, they're very linked. You're ultimately like your business strategy is a reflection of who you are or the things you think matter. So when I think about the biggest lessons I've learned, um, I'll actually start with just life in general, which is um, I'm, I'm gay. And so I came out when I was 21, which, um, you know, some people still think that's late in life for the, the world we live in. But I know for my personal journey, like that was truly like the time when I felt comfortable to honor that really deep sense of knowing I, I knew about myself. And it's still been a journey from there to, to get to the point where I can say it now, you know, to people um, that maybe I'll never meet. They, they can know I'm gay and I'm proud of that. I think... I've learned that inner honesty and, and living life with a sense of integrity to who you know you are is a question only you can answer. Like, I can't tell you what that means for you, but we do know what it means for ourselves. Um, and I think we actually, even if we don't consciously think about it, I think it shows up in our bodies, in our lives, in our happiness when we live life in conflict with our sense of integrity. And I remember that feeling really deeply from when I was when I was not out to my family and friends, just this gnawing sense of unhappiness that came from the fear that was keeping me inside, you know, that that story. Integrity is all about having a sense of wholeness. When Stephen discovered the answers to the questions, why am I building this business and how do I want to live my life? Everything began to line up and he was able to feel true integrity. My purpose statement is that entrepreneurship is most successful at that intersection of self-evolution, business growth, and the creative pursuit. And so when you work with me, I'm very upfront about the fact that there's no business growth without personal growth. So in order to commit to that relationship, they, they want to have that experience. And there are so many people that are realizing that Work is an amazing place to learn about yourself. I always say that there are like three great mirrors in life. One is having a life partner, two is having a child, and three is being an entrepreneur. And I think that owning a business is a huge time in people's lives when all of a sudden things start, you know, staring them back in the face about how they think about money or how they think about themselves when they're leading people or how they think about others and the judgments they might have about their market. So they are definitely seeking that opportunity to use that information for growth. If you're interested in building a business that will leave you as the founder or, or, or even just like an early employee, if, if you're interested in that, then the only way to do it is with genuine integrity and from a place of answering the questions from within and not looking for the answers from other people or from you know what the market's telling you because 
often they're wrong. You know, if I'd listened to that, I would still be living life as a straight man <laughs> who I am not. So honoring your why, I think, is one of the most challenging, but also through that challenge, one of the, the secrets to life, really. Stephen's journey led him from missing the spark of joy in life to starting a business to rediscover it, to getting caught up in conventional business strategy and feeling lost, to truly uncovering his why and building the business around that instead. This has allowed Stephen to feel a true sense of integrity in his life and business, and we hope it might unlock something for you too. In the next episode, we'll dive into how to build a business that truly puts people first. This episode of Small Business Big Lessons was written by me, Ash Reed. Script edited by my teammate, Ariel Tannenbaum, and produced by Rowan Bishop at Message Heard. We're making this podcast because we believe in a different way to do work, and we want to share the stories of the businesses inspiring us. We also share our own story transparently over at buffer.com forward slash open. If this episode has inspired you or is helping you think about building your business in new ways, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at Buffer, head to Apple Podcasts to leave us a review and be sure to subscribe.